Let's start at the beginning. How did this project come to be? How did you get involved with it? Sure. It seems uh, unusual for you because you, you don't usually do animated films. Yeah, I, I'm a producer and owner at Aircraft Pictures, which I own with Andrew Rosen. And uh, traditionally, we've done mostly live action content. But um, on this project, it actually, I first became aware of it about 15 years ago. Uh, I was on a trip with a couple of different families, and we were on a bit of a vacation, and there was one little girl, who happened to be coincidentally Parvana's age, uh, who was reading the book. And uh, after dinner, she asked her mother if she would read aloud to her, and we had a group of about 15 people, probably ranging from 9 to like 65, and slowly we all got sucked in to the story that was being told, and... It was a, a really remarkable experience for me as an adult because you know, it was the first time I'd had as an adult that kind of traditional storytelling experience where everyone just went silent and just listened to this mom read to her daughter. And over the course of the week after dinner, that became our thing, and we read the entire book that way. Uh, so it really stood out to me it was, and, and really a testament to Deborah Ellis's book and, and, and how captivating the story is. And so it wasn't until many years later because um, I, at that time, had just kind of started my producing career, and uh, that I met with the publisher, Groundwood Books, and they to talk about you know potential books that they had available and what rights were available, and they pulled out the breadwinner, and I was like, oh my god, that's the book that we were so enraptured with that time. So we we optioned it, and um, and how did yeah. how did animation get? Was it thought to be maybe a live action film? It was. Um, uh, originally, we thought about doing it as uh, kind of in the vein of like the Kite Runner uh, and that type of thing. But the book itself is um, is actually studied in, as part of the curriculum in a lot of kind of sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade uh, schools um, classes. So we didn't really want to lose that audience, uh, and we thought if we went the Kite Runner route, it would be a little more inaccessible, and and perhaps in making it live action. You know, some of the scenes would be that much harder to take and a little harder to introduce young people to it. So we thought if we went animated, and one phrase that Nora Toomey, the director, coined early on was, you know, it allows us to kind of sugar the pill when we're dealing with some of the harsher realities of of the situation with, through, with animation. So, um, you know, we looked at animated films that really stood out to us that had a really strong artistic point of view and uh, looked at films like Persepolis and The Secret of Kells which Cartoon Saloon had done. So they literally were the first people on our list, and uh, we met with them and, and talked about co-producing the film together, and, um, and they said yes, and the rest is kind of history. You guys uh, have made a lot of music for a lot of movies, uh, both live action and animation. Even your animation stuff has been more the commercial Pixar and Warner Brothers kind of thing. Um, how did... What was the challenges of, of this particular story? This required a different sort of thing, didn't it? It definitely did. And and when we first met with Nora, she said that, you know, the mandate for the music was to, um, in the same way the, the pill was being sugared uh, story-wise and visually, um, that musically she really wanted, you know, true authentic Afghan music to be part of this story. It's, it's their story. Um, she wanted to hear their voices, you know, but also to combine that with Western music and make, make that kind of Afghan music accessible and, and emotionally accessible for um, Western audiences, audiences internationally, um, something that would help tell the story but really give us a sense of place. So our, our big challenge, so Jeff and, and I, when we began our, our studying of Afghan music, and the great thing about animation is you have this great um, lead time. So we literally were working on it a year before our final recording. So we had, on and off, but we had that, all that time to learn about Afghan music, to make our contacts, which ended up to be extremely difficult um, because of the Taliban's their mandate to destroy art, basically, and destroy music. In, in the time that they ruled Afghanistan and Kabul, um, they succeeded in wiping out you know, all music schools, all schools, all education for girls. Um, musicians were um, scattered, uh, stopped playing. So the tradition kind of got broken in a sense, and it's already a very complicated tradition because of 
the tumultuous history of the land, um, there's kind of this melange of Persian and Indian and uh, and then there's all the tribes and they all have their own kind of music. So it was a real challenge for Jeff and I to kind of wrap our heads around it, get into it, and then to find players. And so uh, there's very few in North America. Our original plan was to go to Kabul to record. Uh, the situation had deteriorated that badly kind of, kind of last year. So we ended up having to figure out a way to record the, the those um, Afghan instruments remotely. And we made contact with this school in Afghanistan called the Afghanistan National Institute of Music. This is a school that um, was begun in the days after the Taliban, where they not only teach music, but they also teach girls. It's a co-ed school. So we were able to get in, work our way into that kind of world and record remotely. The music shifts a little for the uh, storytelling sequences, right? You want to talk about uh, the difference? Yeah, it was apparent right away when we saw the film with Nora the first time that the film travels down two parallel tracks. One is real world, as she called it, and story world. Um, the beautiful thing is at the end they merge and they become one and we understand that the story world sequences are all explaining the, the subtext for real world. Um, but we realized that there we needed a slightly different approach for both those things as we move forward in the film. So real world was a little more prosaic, somber, stripped down, not as big an ensemble, not as floral an approach, um, nor even had this thing where she didn't want us to finish any the exposition of any of the themes in the first two reels. Mm. She said, you've written these beautiful themes now. I only want to hear half of it when we first meet Parwana, which was new for us. We, you know, we'd never sort of done that. She's like, we cut it off halfway, like her story's not done. I don't want the music story done, which was an interesting approach and it worked out quite well. But so that was this sort of truncated and small sound for real world. And then story world conversely, very um, colorful, uh, even more of the Afghan sounds and players uh, followed it closer to picture, a little bit more of the animated style of scoring because there's some gymnastics and, and some a lot of fun going on in those those popping um, story world scenes. And then they come to slowly, you know, story world gets a bit darker as the story goes on. Real world gets a bit bigger as she goes to find, uh, she goes to the prison, and then it comes all together right there at the end. Let's talk about the director who isn't here with us today, um, Anora. Uh, how was she selected. Uh, I know that Cartoon Saloon is a relatively new studio, right? Relatively, a couple, 10 years or more, uh, I guess. And they made two features. Yeah, their previous two features were The Secret of Kells and Song of the Sea. Which were directed by Tom Moore, one of the producers here. Yes. So how yeah. did how did Nora get involved with this? Sure. Well, the, the great thing about Cartoon Saloon is they're you know, their studio of artists, uh, the three principals, Paul Young, Tom Moore, and Nora Toomey, uh, all come from animation backgrounds and um, artists themselves. So it was never really set up to be just a vehicle for Tom's work. Um, so in this instance, we, when we approached Cartoon Saloon, uh, we talked about, you know, the story and kind of what we wanted to do with it. And Nora, I guess, had gotten the book and had gone home and read it in one night because she was just, she was so captivated by the story and and what she could do with it. Her mind was racing, and so she came back and pitched us all on this idea of, of her directing and, and how she would do it and everything, and it was pretty unanimous, uh, the decision <laughs> that she was going to be the one to do it. So you're hoping everyone, people around the world, families, will see this movie, and um, can you speak to that, like what you hope they'll they'll get out of it because there's a lot you can get out of this movie you can you learn about the experience of, of this family but but um you know also about the world and there's just so much you can talk about yeah i mean um for i know that you know we never set out to do a movie with a message or a political film or anything right. like that nora was always very adamant about you know this is a young girl's story it's about her it's about her family it's about you know getting her father back um, you know, universal themes that everyone can relate to. Um, and it's been really rewarding seeing different people watch the film. Um, you know, a lot of Afghan people have watched the film and had had nothing but uh, praise for it. I hope as the more more people see it, you know, the more it broadens this discussion and adds kind of a counter argument. This is me personally speaking, like just to some of the arguments out there now for against diversity, you know, in this world. So, you know, we always welcome the chance to, to do much of what was just 
there musically and to take an opportunity with a musical culture like Afghanistan to bring into the spotlight a little bit the music and the musicians that don't usually get certainly in a Hollywood sense or in a, in a, a large scope sense a real fair look and uh, there's some amazing and beautiful music all over the world that's rarely heard. So this was a great opportunity for us to bring forth music, musicians, particularly we're excited to work with the, this choir Mike alluded to that Dr. Sarmas knew about, these little girls who were Parwana's age um, that we got to record from us, just a small school choir. They weren't pros, it doesn't sound like uh, an Anglican church choir. You know, it's not beautiful, but it's just the perfect rough hewn sound for our, our film. And um, that was a session we did via Skype uh, in the middle of the night for us. It was during Ramadan for them, so they were fasting and they had to keep sitting down. So it was it was kind of about was one of those moments you talk about what what's different about it. In this the score is really to, to be able to raise their culture up a little bit into the spotlight was uh, we were grateful to be able to do that. Yeah, and it, it's a privilege to be able to work on a film that just you know if we have any hope it's it's that we all on this planet develop a sense of empathy and understanding for other people and this film is so personal it's a personal story and people it's not people over there it's it's a you're it's a family and um with challenges that you you can relate to when you see them in this film so it was such a privilege for us to be able to work on something that really you know has such a positive um ability to impact people and, and build that bridge. And, and musically, yeah, that was something that was really important to us, that we do bring East and West together like that. I want to thank all you guys. An amazing movie. 